Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show, discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Welcome, everybody. My name is Desiree Duffy, and this is the Books That Make You Show. And today we're talking about books that make you go on an epic science fiction fantasy adventure with an author who imagines a more inclusive world for women in science fiction and fantasy, Rebecca Inch Partridge. She grew up writing stories about the bionic woman meeting Captain Kirk. Her first novel is Escaping the Dashia. Dashia? Dashia. It is a YA science fantasy and it's published by Black Rose Writing. In it, young telepath Twyla, Twyla is kidnapped by her. That's the fun with fantasy, right? The words are, uh, uh, the main character is kidnapped by her mother. And unfortunately, the young girl is forced to participate in the criminal organization that is also her family's business. Now, Rebecca is a member of the Editorial Freelancers Association, Broad Universe. In addition to being an author and a writer herself, she is an editor and she frequently attends and speaks at writers' conferences and at pop pop culture conventions. Uh, Her short stories and articles have appeared in many magazines, She has won honorable mentions in both Writer's Digest and Writers of the Future contest competitions. She received her bachelor's degree from William Jessup University in Management and Ethics. And she says that that in and of itself is not an oxymoron. Rebecca, hello. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. You bet. You bet. Now, this book... Um, is your lifelong dream. This is something that you started working on quite a a while ago. Can you give us the setup and tell us a little bit about your writer's journey? So I wrote that first draft of that book when I was the age of the protagonist, 15. And I got told, you know, oh, that's a nice hobby, but you can't make a living writing. So I put my writing dreams aside to pursue career, family, Every once in a while, I would pull it out, I would revise, I would rewrite, and I got close a couple of times um, and thought that I was going to have a book deal and something would come up and happen and it would fall through. So I almost didn't believe it was really going to happen this time until I'd signed on the dotted line and had a contract in my hand. And then it seemed, okay, maybe this is really going to happen. But when I finally actually had that physical book in my hand, I have to tell you, there was no feeling like it in the world, except for maybe giving a birth to my son. But that only took nine months. This took, well, um, a decade or two. Yeah, but but book babies take a lot longer to gestate, don't they? They Um, do. (laughs) Now, okay, in many ways, your writing seems to have come full circle because, I mean, it was only, what, a couple of years ago that you were in high school writing this book, and now here you are today. Is there anything that you would say to your high school friends? Is there like a, hey, if my high school friends could see me now type of a thing? Well, I had a very small group of friends. We were tight knit. Um, We were not the popular crowd. I was a science geek and a Jehovah Witness. So I didn't participate in a lot of the social norms. Um, but many of those friends that I did have from high school, I'm still in contact with, and some of them are going to make it up here to Auburn, California to be at my, uh, book launch. So that's really exciting. But I also got teased and made fun of a lot. Um, girls in science just was not a thing. And, um, being a Jehovah witness led to a lot of misconceptions. And so to those who knew that I was writing a book and laughed at me for it, I just picture them walking into a bookstore and seeing it on the shelves and seeing Rebecca Inch Partridge and going, I wonder if that's the same girl from high school. Because I'd want to go, yes, it is. 
<laughs> now, uh, your your family and growing up was a little bit different than than what your main characters is is going through. Uh, but I think it's important to point out and please tell us about growing up in your household. What was it like? What was your mom like? Tell us. Well, my mom was the furthest opposite of the abusive mother that Twyla has in there. My mom, in fact, was so darn nice that the friends that I had wanted to hang out at my house because they liked getting attention from my mom and she would listen to them. And um, she was just a sweetheart. So I could never complain about how awful my home was because my friends would say, we know your mom, you're so lucky, she's so nice. I wish my parents were that nice. So in order to fulfill my Cinderella complex, I had to create an evil mother who makes the the stepmother in Cinderella, you know, seem like an angel. Mm -hmm. Um, But the one other thing about my mom is despite uh, being raised in a time and in a household where the man brought home the bacon and double income homes were just beginning to be and were controversial, Um, Even though she didn't pursue her writing career, she very much encouraged me to to keep writing and and to enjoy the process of writing. Oh, and I I love that, how that all just kind of has a nice, cozy wraparound for us, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I I do want to talk to you about women in science fiction and fantasy and, and how it's changed. But first, I just want to go back. So. The Bionic Woman and Captain Kirk, and you, you, you were watching a lot of Star Trek too. I take it back in the day. Oh. How, how did that influence your, or does that influence your writing? So Star Trek was one of the few shows that my dad wouldn't make us channel check. He had a very low patience for commercials, and there was no remote control, so we'd have to switch the channel. Mm-hmm. But with Star Trek, we all sat there as a family: mom, dad, us three girls. And we would talk about it. We would talk about the issues. We would talk about the things that came up. And so you have that as one thing, this this wonderful Federation universe. And then my hero complex. I wanted to go save the world. So it wasn't Jamie Summers, the bionic woman who met Captain Kirk. It was Saver Rebecca, the first bionic woman before Jamie Summers who uh, met Captain Kirk and had a whole bunch of adventures saving the world. And so Saver Rebecca is still with me, is a different persona than Twyla, who came about when I was 15 and is still with me. She lives in my head and is my alter ego. She says the things I wish I could say. She does the things I wish I could do. And that's what she did for me at 15, too. Star Trek in its day, what Gene Roddenberry created was very avant-garde and cutting edge. Mm -hmm. And he did a lot on that show. I think he probably wanted to do more. Actually, I've heard the stories of how he wanted to do more. How do you think that's impacted and influenced women science fiction and fantasy writers of today? Well, to give us an idea of the then and now, um, one of the things Gene Roddenberry wanted to do in the Menagerie, which we know was the precursor to what became the Star Trek we know, um, he wanted to have a female first officer. And the network said, nope, nope, nope. And so that actress ended up becoming Nurse Chapel. And um, you flash forward to Voyager, And nobody even blinked an eye at Captain Janeway. Mm -hmm. A female captain was perfectly acceptable. And there's been a lot of groundbreaking things that Star Trek did to push the edge. Since since Roddenberry couldn't have the female first officer, he put a black female officer on the bridge at the communication station. And Uhura really broke as many barriers, I think, as a female first officer would have. I I think that did more to encourage inclusiveness um, that the network didn't even see it coming. I mean, no, you can't have that. Okay, well, how about I just settle for this? Okay, fine, whatever. Um, And he, he snuck in a little bit more diversity. 
Mm -hmm. And as they say, we've come a long way, baby. But how do you feel about our progress as women in this realm? Do you think we have a ways to go yet? Well, of course we have a ways to go, but I think it is important to look at where we came from. When I went to my first science fiction convention, I was one of very few women under 50 there. And even over 50, it was very, very sparse in the female department. And there proportionately were more in the audience. And it was pretty rare when there was a female on the panel. Mm-hmm. Now it's a 50 50 mix on the panel, even though it's only a 40 60 split in the audience. So, you know, what's happening there? I'm not sure. But the other thing that just really struck me is when my son read Lord of the Rings, I was amazed. Great. He, you know, he's, he's in fourth grade reading something like that. So I gave him Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Singer and figured he wouldn't have any problem understanding it. If, I mean, come on, if you can read Tolkien, you can read Anne McCaffrey. Yeah. And he came out puzzled. And he said, Mom, I just don't understand this. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, what sentences don't you understand? What words, What you know, what's the problem? Because he was only fourth grade. And he goes, no, 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 I'm reading the sentences. I see what they say. It just doesn't make sense. And I'm like, okay, what in there? And he's like, she can't, she's not allowed to be a bard. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's because she's a woman. Oh, so women of their race, they've got terrible voices. Well, no, it's just in their culture, women are bards. Oh, well, why? Well, because that's the way it is. But why? And he could not comprehend that it was just something they were not allowed to do. And that made me realize how different his perspective is. And so that's something I enjoy. But at the same time, we cannot sit on our laurels and say everything is fine. Because when you look at STEM careers, science, technology, engineering, math, the numbers are still very disproportionate. And women still make a very small part. And a matter of fact, um, in the technology industry, it is amazingly small. And I want to say it's under 30%, if that. And in some areas, it's less than 10%. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the things that surprised me is when a university sent out six identical resumes, that one was a male name, one was a female name, and sent it out to several different openings in laboratories, 80% of the men got called for interviews compared to only 20% of the women with identical resumes. So yeah, we still have a little ways to go, but I think science fiction community is one of those communities that is trying to push to have inclusiveness. Now there's still the old guard that some of them aren't quite comfortable with that. And there is a little bit of tension in the community over what's going too far to be inclusive but we're definitely making progress. Yeah. How, how dare we go too far in being inclusive with others? I say, yeah. as I roll my eyes, um, your name as well, Rebecca, did that create any controversy at all? It did. Um, so when I was young and eager and thinking that I was going to be able to sell a very early draft of that book, um, I got, to a certain point in the process and uh, the editor from a publishing house goes, okay, well, you know, this has got a chance. What name would you like to be published published under? And I said, oh, I don't have a pseudonym. And they're like, okay, but you're going to have to come up with one. What name do you want? And I'm like, I, I pause and I'm like, why? Kind of like my son, not cluing in. And they're like, oh, well, we can't publish science fiction with, with a, you know, obviously female name Rebecca, haven't you heard of CJ Sherrith, you know, Andre Norton, and it swore me that just 20 years ago, that was still the case. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Even JK Rowling, I remember reading about how that's why JK Rowling is JK Rowling. 
know, she was writing about a young boy with magical powers. They couldn't have but known that she was a woman way, way back then. And that was not that long ago. Right. And it's kind of sad that they went that way because that was right at the time period where it used to be a given that if it had a male protagonist, YA female readers would still read it. But mm -hmm. if it had a female protagonist, YA males would not read it. And of course, uh, Hunger Games blew that out of the water a while later. But it was at a time when that would have been the chance to break that whole thing of guys not willing to read a female author. Yeah. Makes you wonder what it would have been like if it was different, if we had that time machine and we could go back. Now, you are a member of Broad Universe and you're very much supportive of having role models. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, okay. So first of all, Broad Universe, which actually allows men in, um, it is a group that helps female authors and members of the community navigate and it's a supportive uh, platform just a really good organization to belong to so for instance when I was at uh, world fantasy which of course it's not easy to get on panels at world fantasy but broad universe had a rapid fire reading of their members and as a member I got to do a reading at a world fantasy convention and have people come up to me and ask me, when is that book coming out? And so it opens doors. That's the, the easiest way to say it. Yeah. And you do a lot of speaking. And I'm going to flip over to the editing and craft side a little bit, if you don't mind. Because you also work with writers on mm -hmm. their books. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell us why, Rebecca, why do you think it is that a writer should never finish or should never publish their first draft? Oh, man, you just touched on a really um, pivotal point with me. So if there was one thing as an editor I could scream from the mountaintop, it would be, please do not publish your first draft. And here, here are the reasons. One, very, very, very few authors nail it on their first draft. That's just a given. Two, if you publish that book and then decide you want to revise it, agents and editors from traditional publishing houses very rarely, very rarely will give it another shot. Three, you've already alienated some of your readers by putting something out there that's subpar. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to do that. So many self-published books that were a first draft, I see the potential and I just want to weep because with a, a, a bit of a rewrite, they really could have been something spectacular and the author shot themselves in the foot. And it is a matter of patience and it is hard to say, okay, I spent a year writing this book. I want the world to see it. Uh, no, you don't. You want a few critiquers, a writer's group, beta readers to give you feedback so that then you get an idea of what the reader gets from it because you know what you thought you were saying. You know what you meant. It might not be what the reader reads and you might take for granted things that aren't actually on the page. And that's a big, big issue with first drafts. Yeah, you, you've nailed so many truths right there. A lot of times it seems like new authors become very precious about their writing and they don't want anybody to see it and critique it because they feel that, that it's just too close to them, right? Mm -hmm. But professional writers work with editors, they work with beta readers, they they take criticism and they make changes. And even something that might have been written 20 years ago, times change, the way we're oh. telling stories change. Yeah, I had to change the technology quite a bit from when I first wrote my book. Yeah. And I want to dig into your world building and your philosophies there. But first, let's 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 stay on the editing path, because I'm curious to know what kinds of books, what kinds of projects do you like to edit? What genres are your favorites? Well, if I could make a living just doing science fiction and fantasy, I would be in heaven. But 
science fiction and fantasy only makes up seven to nine percent of the fiction market. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I have found besides mysteries, which that's that's always fun because it's so exciting to go through and see how they end it and make sure that it actually builds to it. Um, But memoirs, people are writing fabulous memoirs and that is different than a biography Mm -hmm. it is a story with an arc and character building and I love a good memoir yeah and what is your collaborative process all about tell us how you work with a a writer on their Uh, their I'm a lot different than most editors Um, first of all I want to make sure that me and the writer are a good fit. Mm -hmm. If there's not a level of communication, camaraderie, uh, however you want to put it, I don't want to say chemistry, but um, then I'm going to pass them on to another editor. So I'll do a, a sample free pages and we'll sit down, we'll talk and we'll see if the project's right for me, if I'm the right one for them. From there though, It's my firm philosophy that I can't edit an entire manuscript if I don't know how it ends. Because how can I give advice on the beginning and the foreshadowing and the character building if I don't know the art to make sure that this is putting the reader in the right direction? And so I do a global read for a flat B and... um, mark up the end of the chapter, do big picture things so that they're not paying me a per page rate on pages that are not going to look anything like that on the final product. Characters get merged because most authors start off with way too many characters. Scenes get merged or deleted. um, And there's just no use rearranging chairs on the Titanic. So um, then after I've done the global read, I encourage them to sit on the manuscript for a little bit, let it rest, let their attachment rest, then go back and do a rewrite before they bring it to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I'm, I'm laughing because before when we started, I told you that there's a little bit, I don't know, you can't hear it, but every once in a while I'll hear my voice echo back to me and I sound very demonic, demonic. So when I was just saying that I heard this in the background, it's okay. It's okay. (laughs) My microphone is not in any way. Yeah, it's okay. Um, So I want to segue over to world building at this point, because you have created such an intricate world. And tell us about your methodology there. Well, first of all, the Praxis Star Cluster is my sandbox. I love playing in my imaginary universe. But I world build backwards from most people. Um, I've done Contact, which is a convention where you start with a planet is X size, X distance from the sun, and extrapolate from there. Mm -hmm. I start with characters because I'm a character-driven writer, and I know these people. They have conversations in my head, and I'm not insane. At least I hope not. And in order for those characters to be who they are, I need to decide what race they are. And some people are just rather cat-like, so Hittians. Some people are very avian-like. Well, guess what? I made cyans. It's an avian race, evolved from birds. And so then it was, okay, I got to backwards engineer this. So I did what Anne McCaffrey did with her dragons, is... Instead of just saying, okay, my dragons exist, this is a fantasy novel, get over it. She went and said, how could dragons have existed? And then she had them scientifically created by the people out of their little dragons, their insects. So I went and said, okay, on what kind of a planet would things that are actually mineral rock creatures evolve into sentient beings. Think the Horda from Star Trek um, on a grander scale. On what world would avian races have the advantage? 
And so then I come up with the planet. And in so doing, I create their whole history. I know the first contact situation and what level of technology each planet was on when the tree people, the Phlegoans, first contacted them. And, you know, the, the history makes the world, the culture of that world, and the culture of that world influences the character. And that's religion, that's societal norms, it's social economic conditions. And so um, it all feeds backwards from the characters. And you infuse a bit of spirituality into your your writing as well, don't you? I do. And I don't know that people will catch it in the first book because the message is a plain, simple, stay true to who you are, do the right thing, even if it's difficult and even if there's a high price to pay. But I make it very clear in this first book that Twyla does not believe in anything. She's mm-hmm. got no kind of spiritual belief, religious belief. And as the saga goes on, she meets somebody who is very spiritually devout and has a faith that she's jealous of. And it makes her question, why does she not believe in anything? Because well, she's bitter. She, <laughs> she, she went through a lot of abuse. And so then seeing this, guy that has been through a lot too lean into his faith instead of having to deal with these things alone um gives her the idea of pursuing and he encourages her like my mom did um encourages her to find her own belief system and not tell her what to believe yeah that's fantastic. So this book, this is book one, though, right? People can expect a lot more. Yeah. Tell, t- yeah. tell us about the series as a whole, as much as you can. Okay. Well, in a, in a perfect world, book one is the first in a triple trilogy. Each trilogy will stand alone as Twyla goes through her life. Um, this first trilogy, which the second book is due to my publisher like any day now, and I'm trying to get the beta reader stuff and everything in for the rewrite. Um, it takes Twyla through her coming of age story. And she goes from what could have been a victim if she wasn't so fierce and uncooperative and feisty. I mean, the favorite description I have is somebody saying, oh, man, you're as feisty as the red hair on your head. Because that's Twyla. Mm-hmm. Um, she refuses to be seen as a victim, but she could have been. She goes from that broken child to a kick-ass heroine. And she she goes and becomes Saver Rebecca eventually. And it's just Saver Twyla. And goes and rescues the guy. Um, I do like flipping that around sometimes Mm -hmm. um, when he ends up, you know, figuratively tied to a railroad track. So... um, Love it. A lot of fun. And I have those first three books drafted. So I'm just so eager to get there. (laughs) Well, I know I can't wait. And I'm sure that your readers won't be able to wait either. Rebecca, can you tell people where they can go to find you online? Give us your website and where they can go to find the books books too. Okay. So my website is www.ripartridge.com. Um, and the book is available on Amazon. I do encourage people who are trying to support bookstores Mm -hmm. to either order from Barnes and Noble or to go ahead and order from your local bookstore. Um, and it is available to order from any bookstore, just like any other book. And hopefully they'll enjoy it enough to maybe post a review. If I can put that little plug in there. Yes, of course, of course, of course. Excellent. Rebecca Inch Partridge, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. You bet. You bet. And thank you, everybody, for being with us as well. You can find out more about us on our website. It's booksthatmakeyou.com. We're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and, of course, YouTube. Make sure you ring the bell, subscribe, and leave some comments down there as well so that the YouTube algorithm picks it up and spreads Mm -hmm. it far and why also don't forget to sign up for the books that make you webby award winning newsletter so you always get news and information about books and authors delivered directly into your inbox on a monthly basis until next time 
all of my bookish buddies. Please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are. The host and executive producer of the Books That Make You Show is Desiree Duffy. Sound mastering and engineering by Dave Napox. Social media and content promotion by Siddi Jahagirdar. Copywriting and editing by Mike Robinson. The Books That Make You Show is an award-winning podcast produced by Black Chateau Enterprises.